Hi, good afternoon. I'm Dave Spade. I am uh, proud to be fretboard blues um, guitarist or guitar player or whatever uh, of the month for June. And um, I've been asked to basically start off this one and, and maybe the others as well by, by talking about who has influenced me, how I've learned to play guitar, um, and how the story starts. I, I started when I didn't start till I was 17. Uh, I didn't own a guitar for two years, nearly two and a half. I, I did my first gig and I didn't own a guitar. Um, I, I slowly managed to get the money together to, to purchase one. But my, my first introduction to guitar, acoustic guitar playing, was, was via Bob Dylan. Um, I heard Dylan play and thought, ooh, and then I got told there was a folk club in a place called Warrington, near where I lived. And I went there and there was a room with 300 people in it. And you could hear a pin drop and somebody playing a guitar. And I thought, hmm, I'd like some of that. And so I kept going. And the guy, two brothers ran it, Jack and Norman Froggett. I'm still in touch with them. And it was Jack that said, you can't keep coming in for free if you're not going to play. <sighs> Come on, okay. And the first song I ever performed in public was Hard Rains Are Gonna Fall. And it finishes with the line, I'll know my song well before I start singing. And I've always stuck with that. I, I am intolerant. I am intolerant of a lot of things. But I'm intolerant of people who have words in front of them. Um, I just think it's insulting. It's me. You know, I've got my opinions. You've got your... It's insulting to an audience to, to not know exactly what you're going to do before you start to do it. And I think I've probably got about 80 numbers now that I have at performance standard. But anyway, back to Warrington. Saw these people doing this and thought, whoa, wow, I've got to get some of that. And went to this folk club most weeks for a, a long time and saw everybody. I saw Martin Carthy when he was first starting out. And uh, Louis Killen, Bob Davenport, Cyril Tawney. These were all the the people who were who were famous in folk music and used to sit on the front row watching the fingers because in those days there wasn't any YouTube, there weren't any instruction videos. So what you did was you watched on the front row and then in the interval, because I was only 17, 18, you go up and say, show us that bit you did in that song, that bit, that chord, you know, what was it? Was it that D9? Oh yeah, I'm having that. And you, you asked people and nagged them and and everyone was really kind. Everyone was really, really kind. They would let you play the guitar for the entirety, their guitar for the entirety of the, of the interval. And uh, play some lovely Gibsons and Martins and all sorts of stuff that I, I could never afford. And carried on sort of learning them. I and it was, it was all this sort of... That people were doing at the time. It's sort of arpeggio stuff. And then in 1966, I think it was, I saw a guy called Paul Simon. And he turned up at a folk club in Widnes first, and then on the Wednesday, that was on the Monday night, and on the Wednesday he turned up in Warrington. And he played things like this. <laughs> He showed me that. I nagged him and he showed me how he played that. He he actually um, sat down and wrote it out and I've since taught thousands of people to play. Which is how it starts when you first do it and it becomes... It starts off slowly, everything starts off slowly. And I showed him things from... Uh, He didn't know that and I could play because that's what you did you learned to play Angie you didn't know what you were doing on a guitar but you learned to play Angie because that's what everyone that was the rite of passage of manhood <laughs> and about the same time that the next guitarist that came along was a lovely lovely man who is um, there is um, if you go onto my Facebook page there is a link to an archive 
interview he does with a guy in the States, a lovely guy called Wiz Jones. And Wiz will be ooh, in his 80s now and still performs, still plays. If you get a chance to see him in your locality, do because he's, he is um, a treasure. <laughs> and he played things like... Um, Everything I do, there are always mistakes, if you want, or as my mate Jim Murray would say, it's jazz, because <laughs> jazz is just blues with mistakes. <laughs> and so I saw him, and that was mind-blowing, because I'd never heard of Blind Boy Fuller. You've got to remember, we're back in, in the mid-60s, early 60s, and 64, 65, 66 time. And there weren't any blues records anywhere. You couldn't hear anybody. I used to go into a guitar shop in, in Liverpool called Frank Hesse's. And there was a guy there who would play me... Um, Saturdays and say play us that broomsy bit will you and then watch him and, and and I slowly learned to play bits of big Bill Broomsy um, the big the big transition for me at the time I, I was playing bits of broomsy uh, and bits of folk songs and flat picking you know <laughs> anything that, that came along because everything was new everything was exciting Everything was um, different. It was just a new skill, a new trick, something, something to learn that you didn't know. I mean, people. Um, You learn to slap the strings rather than pluck them, and then you also learn to hit them. And you learn all sorts of things from watching different people. Um, because playing blues is, is not, it's not a, a delicate occupation. Um, I'll come to that more of that in a minute. But the next, the next guitarist that I saw was a guy called Reverend Gary Davis. And... It was the second Keel Folk Festival. At the first Keel Folk Festival, let me go back to 65. I'll ramble, trust me, I'll ramble. 1965, first Keel Folk Festival, a guy called Paul Oliver is doing a talk. And he he's playing various people that he got these field recordings from God knows where. First time I'd heard slide guitar ever. I don't think it was Robert Johnson. It was, I think it was probably Charlie Patton. Uh, it may have been Sunhouse. But suddenly there were photographs of these steel, or brass, steel resonator guitars, and I heard the sound and I thought, what? And the guy I'm sitting with is this guy I talked about, Jack Frog. He said, yeah, I used to have one of them. Give it away, I didn't like it. <laughs> They're worth a lot of money nowadays, but... So I was introduced to this music that sounded otherworldly. It wasn't English folk music on the beat. It had a backbeat, it swung. And that piqued my interest, but I had no way of exploring it. The only album I think, I, I, I found a blues album in Nems in Liverpool, and it was Josh White. And Josh White is sanitised blues. It's, it's um, lounge blues really it, it's not um, it's not the blues that i come to know and love but anyway 19 i go and see come to the keel folk festival i'm 18 years of age and there's gary davis now it's supposed to be doc watson 
because I'd learnt to play. Um... <laughs> I've got it right because at that time it mattered to me that I got things right now it I'm, I'm sorry now it doesn't I I play the guitar my way I do what I do and I do it one because I really really enjoy it and two because there's there's part of me in it um, Blues to me is not an intellectual exercise, it's something you feel in your gut, never mind your heart, it's not up here, it's here, it's in your whole body. And again, I'll come to that more of that in a minute, but then I was expecting um, Doc Watson, and I was really pissed off. I said, oh, there's this old black guy called Gary Davis, who's he, never heard of him. <laughs> and there's this guy sitting over in the corner with a trill beyond, a big duffel coat and uh, he's just sitting there and I've got a guitar with me, it wasn't my guitar, it was a guitar to a guy, friend of mine who's since died, so I've got a lovely guy I'd known from school, a guy called Peter Lowe and it was an Epiphone Cortez, like a little tiny, tiny bodied Gibson but it was the cheap version, it was the Epiphone and I, um, no fear, walked straight over to him and said, <coughs> excuse me, could you play us a bit of guitar mister, <laughs> I wanted to see wanted to see what he could do and if it, this is a lovely story he, he actually picked the guitar up and went and he ran his hand round it and said this I'm a little baby guitar you you take it back and you put it in the case so till it grows up some I, I, I don't want to hurt it now <laughs> and I thought hmm. but that that was him because the guitar he played was a, a big Gibson J200 and he played just with a thumb and a finger pick not with three fingers on this hand you know just a thumb and a finger pick and played all these amazing dance band tunes military tunes all sorts of stuff and I'm just looking at this guy going up and down the fretboard thinking what the Jesus Christ what an air what but he's also singing and when he sang he didn't just sing like people were singing folk songs he and his whole body shook and I saw this later in life when I when I saw Sunhouse and when he played the guitar he didn't play it here his hand started up here and came down and hit the guitar whacked it and it was all to do with energy and with volume because nowadays we're lucky I mean this guitar's got a pickup in it you know and I've got a nice PA a Bose PA I plug it in I've got a nice microphone I can whisper if I want and I can play really quietly if I want and it booms out but in those days it was acoustic and if you couldn't play loud you couldn't be heard and it wasn't until 1979 when I, I bring this, I'll bring other guitars, I'll tell you about this one in a sec, I'll bounce all over the place. It wasn't until much later I got a guitar that was loud enough to, to play with, but Gary Davis had this big Gibson and he, he, he sat in a chair and I also say he smoked 200, he didn't smoke 200 of his cigarettes, but he, he smoked every, I think it must have been about 80 of them, he smoked two packs a day, each day, the My Cigarettes. And I got him a cigar and that was okay. And I also bought him um, half a bottle of whiskey. And if Maddie Pryor ever sees this, then she'll think it was you, you bastard. Because no one was supposed to buy him drink. It wasn't allowed. You weren't allowed to buy him alcohol. And he just nagged me. He said, come get me some drink. He said, come get me some drink or I won't play any more guitar for you. Because I was sitting right next to him for most of the weekend, other than briefly on Early morning on Saturday, he was dragged off to bed, much moaning like hell, because obviously, as a, as a, not being funny, but as a blind guy, day and night doesn't make any difference to him. And he was dragged off to bed. I think it was about, I heard him muttering one o'clock in the morning, he was up again to do a concert on the Sunday. But Friday night, I, did, I just sat up and watched him all night. And, I, and I, I had no idea what he was doing, what he was playing, why he was playing it. 
And he said to me early one in the morning, he said, you know, play me something. And I said, I can't play like you play. He said, don't matter, play me something. And so I, you know, played. He went, mm, yeah, okay. Yeah, and took the guitar back and proceeded to show me how to play. Um, guy called David Byrne who um, used to go to this folk club in Warrington and he had one of those little old Philips reel-to-reel -reel tape records 178s on them. and he used to have a, a piece of garden cane and a load of sticky tape and a microphone and he used to record people wherever he went and he recorded Gary Davis and lent me the tape and so I spent hours trying to replicate what I'd seen quickly and heard because there comes a point with, with learning where if it's too much, if it's, it's way beyond where you are, you just go, wow, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, really good. But you've got no idea of, of how to do it and what you do. And as you get older, you find that it, it comes easier. Your ears work better and you, you can learn stuff. So that's Gary Davis. That was Gary Davis. I could talk more about him because he really left a massive mark on me and because of seeing him, I stopped doing folk songs. Stopped all that stuff altogether. The only thing I wanted to do was blues. And the only album I could come across, um, there, was, there was one with uh, on Extra, um, Sonny Cherry, Brownie McGee, Big Bill Brunsey. And I got that, and with it, a live, it's a live album with Studs Terkel. And there was also an extra rural blues double album, which had Robert Johnson, and Sunhouse, and Charlie Lincoln, and Pegleg Howell, and all these amazing names. Um, they thought, wow. I must go back though and say that there was a point where there's an EP of Howling Wolf in here and with, with, you know, with um, Smokestack Lightning. But I was lucky I saw Fred McDowell, I saw Terry and McGee, I saw a different thing altogether, Champion Jack Dupree playing the piano. Just really 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 entertaining and one guitarist I, I, I've omitted who I, I got to know briefly about the same time as I first came across Wiz Jones was a guy called Chris Thompson and I don't know what's happened to Chris I think Wiz last time told me he was still in London somewhere or maybe that he'd gone to New Zealand but he had an old Stella 12 string and I've never seen anyone play it, even, you know, talk about McTell and Lead Belly. I've never seen anyone play a 12-string like Chris Thompson could play it. And this Stella had cracks all the way down it. It was, it was just falling apart. Um, but he swung. He swung. He, was, he did a version of Comeback Baby when... Again, hit the guitar. He, he you know, it, it's, it's the difference between doing and it's it's the it's the attack that you use. It, it's the way that you go about it. And everyone that I've seen, all you know, if you had the chance over the last few years, he's now sadly gone to see Honey Boy Edwards. Again, uh, a guitarist who mesmerized 
absolutely mesmerised. And one other one that I mustn't forget, and I remember, and if you want to pull me back on certain things, just send me a message and say, look, Dave, you, you went down an alley, then you stopped and came back and then went down another one. I will do that. Um, was John Lee Hooker. We'd actually gone to Manchester. This was again in, in 67. We'd gone to Manchester to see Roland Kirk. Um, saxophone is as good as blues guitar. It really is. And Roland Kirk was the only guy I've ever seen play three saxophones at once or play flute and nose flute at the same time. And we'd, we'd gone to see him and it was a shame really because before he was on there was a guy called Tubby Hayes on with a drummer and the drummer was a guy called Philly Joe Jones who is an amazing black drummer. And the sound wasn't right but that wasn't the performer's fault, it was the fault of the guy doing the sound. And somebody thought it would be a really good idea to shout out we can hear nothing but drums. And it was true, but when Roland Kirk came out, he said, you have just heard one of the finest drummers in the world. And if you could hear him, that was great. And went into a toxic, really aggressive set for about half an hour and then just walked off. And I think he was meant to be playing for longer than that. Uh, but he was angry. He was angry with the people who criticised Philly Joe Jones. Um, I saw Roland Kirk at other times and he, he was... He was <laughs> I know it's about fretboard blues, but you've got to talk about people who do things with a passion. You have to really, really mean it. And we came out and thought, oh, great. And there's this poster, you know, John Lee Hooker, Tony McPhee and the Groundhogs and various other bands. And we thought, ah. Oh, Got enough, back in we went and listened to electric blues and listen there's loads of really good electric blues players, uh, I know Mr Knopfler, Mr Clapton has made a lot of money out of it and you know all this noodling which I can't do, I've never had an interest in doing it, um, is what most people see of as the blues and to me the blues is, it's the John Lee Hooker came on, having again been listening in the wings to all these people going through, and all he did was this. And then sang him and stabbed his foot, and everyone in the whole building was stamping the feet to this guy just going, and that's all he was doing. And then he go, whole song, that's all it was. There was no no fret, no, nothing up here, just there, that's all he did. And I came away from that thinking, wow, good grief. Because there's a point in learning guitar where you you want to get really slick and you want to get really fast. I used to be much faster than I am, but I had a bad car accident years ago and bits of glass ended up in my wrists and my hands just wouldn't work as fast anymore. But they still work fast enough and what improves as you get older is your timing. Your sense of timing improves and you, you just get better at delivery because what you do is you put the guitar down and you sing. Because blues is, is not guitar gymnastics. Blues is, blues is a, a feeling, it, it's a way of being. Um, there are lots of guys I know around the country, um, in particular there's my good friend Jim Murray uh, in the northeast, part of the Holcomb Hotshots, who is an equal love of the music. Him and Pete Mason have entertained people for years. There's Lee Bates, who's another player up there. Um, George Shovelin, I, I used to know, um, I haven't seen George for many years, he used to do some fabulous Snooks Eaglin numbers. And then up in the northeast, there's Richie and Alan Jones and Richard Wren. And these are people who 
do the blues proud and of course I mustn't forget that Steve Phillips over in, in Robin Hood's Bay Steve was the first um, English guy I heard do I've been busy I've been busy doing you know, um, and thinking yeah but I'd bought that lovely album uh, King of the Delta Blues by Robert Johnson and thought what the, what the hell's going on here yeah you know, it was a long time before I worked out you know how to do the uh... and and you know um... and if I had it, I'll get it, I'll bring another guitar at the time and do some slide stuff for you but Steve was the first one I heard do Crossroads, as a, you know, as a as a white guy doing Crossroads, and I just thought, what? And I came away a bit depressed. And my mate Les, a lovely guy called Les Staves, who is a a songwriter beyond compare, and a showman beyond compare. He still lives in Leeds, and and I said, oh, oh that's really oh, put me off now. He's, he's he does Robert Johnson, I can't do Robert Johnson. He said, yeah, but he doesn't do Big Bill Brunty, Dave. And I don't think he still does. He does the odd number. Um, because everybody plays the blues in their own way. Everyone, whatever, whatever excites you, whatever gives you pleasure so that you can sit there for two or three hours and play and play and play and play and play and just come in. God, that was good, because you know, more and more with lockdown, people are talking about mental illness and not feeling great. Well, you've got a guitar, you've always got a buddy, you've always got a friend, you've always got some way of losing yourself in music. Not using this, but just pulling it into you and, and letting the music overwhelm you and take you over so that you're not thinking anymore. I do crossroads nowadays, and the one thing, there's the one, that, or there's, there's two or three numbers that I do like that, that aren't slide numbers, where I never know where I'm going to start and where it's going to end. If I, you know, we're talking about John Lee Hooker just doing. There's a number that Brunsey does that goes in the evening. In the evening. When the sun goes down In the evening now, darling When the sun goes down And there's... Come out of it. There's, there's a little guitar work very little guitar work. It's it's it, it's 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 about time. It's about leaving space. Um, two 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 things to say before I leave this video. And uh, please come back to me and say, look, talk more about this, or play more guitar, or sing or something. Or do what you know, just tell me what you want. Um, the two Seegers. One was Pete Seeger back in the sixties, and he says. It's not the notes you play, it's the notes you leave out that count. So leave space, leave, leave room in the music for what you do. And the other one was Peggy Seeger. And she said, sing the song first. Um, there was a lovely young guy down south called Jonathan who cut in touch and said he, he lost his mojo, he had he, gone. You know, he, I'm not going to play it. Like, no, no, look, 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 put the guitar down. And I mean this to everybody. Put the guitar down. Listen to the song, get the lyrics and sing them. Sing them like your life depends on it. Sing it like you really, 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 really mean it. And then when you've done that, pick up the guitar and work out which bit of guitar is going to work best for you with actually completing that song. I've talked for half an hour, I could talk all bloody day, as you'll probably find out. I hope this is okay for you. Um,
please send me some feedback. I, I, I principally play Big Bill Brooms here. I play some Robert Johnson. I can do some John Hurt, a uh, bit of Blind Blake, um, various people. Um, some people like George Carter only only ever recorded four songs. Lovely song called Rise in Liver Blues. Or there's um, nice sort of melodic Charlie Patton numbers. There's various things that I do. Um, if you're interested, go on to my website. Just put Dave Spade into Google. It'll come up. You can go on to Bandcamp in there and you can listen to all the stuff that I do. And if you hear something on one of those CDs uh, that are on Bandcamp, they're free to listen to. The individual tracks are free to listen to then let me know, you know, saying, can you show us that one or can you play us that one? Then I'll gladly do it. I'm sorry there's only been one um, video this week. Um, I'll tend to do them on Wednesdays and Saturdays or Sundays. Saturday's a bit better day. Uh, and I'll do two next week and two the week after and two and two and two and two and two. But, if, you know, guide me, help me, because as you've heard, I, I can talk for a long time and not really say a great deal. But... Um, Lots of stories, lots of interesting people that I've met. Uh, once played a gig with um, Duke Boy Bonner, Texas blues man, and felt this big. I did a really good set. Christ, I was on form. And then this guy got up and just blew me off stage. Um, Dave Kelly out the blues band always reveres his sister. The first time Joanne Kelly came up north that I know of, she was support for me. Uh, that quickly changed. Uh, thereafter, I played support for her on three different occasions. Lots of stories, lots of stuff to talk about. But what comes across with the blues, sadly for you guys, is not the fretboard, it's not the blues, it's not the guitar. It's the performance, it's the delivery, it's the song. And, and that's what matters. Listen, thanks for your time. If you've managed to stay here and not fall asleep till then, well done, well done. Send me some messages, send me some ideas, and um, I'll modify what I do. The other videos will be about 15 minutes, and if you want, I'll, I'll put a song into each one, as well as talking bollocks. And this guitar, last thing, sorry, this guitar is a, I got it from my friend Jim Murray. It's a 1910 Vega. Vega. Um, the neck is stuck onto it in the same way that a violin neck is put on. And, and when I bought it from Jim, it was, it was made in 1910, the, the bridge was cracked, the fretboard was shocking, and the, um, the pegs were really highly geared. So when you were trying to tune it, you turned it a fraction, <laughs> three tones later. <laughs> Jesus, I So this has got new Waverleys on it. It's got a new fretboard done by a lovely guy. If you ever want guitar repairs doing in the UK, and you're in the north by Peter Barton in Addingham. And he made this lovely bridge and put these pins in it. And it's, it's a sweetheart of a little guitar. It weighs nothing. It, it's, it's, um, it probably weighs less than two and a half pounds. It's, it's, uh, it's a lovely guitar. Uh, mahogany back and sides. Next time I'll play my Philips guitar for you. That was made in 79 and that's Brazilian rosewood. That's very pretty. I always tell people that I, I slept with Joan Baez and stole it from her. Um, thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.